In this lecture segment, we continue to talk about American art before World War II, with a focus on works of art made in the 1930s and early 1940s. In 1929, the stock market crashed and the United States plunged into the Great Depression. It was a turbulent and challenging period of time. Many artists in the 1930s created responses to the changes in American society. In the 1920s, with precisionism like we explored in The City View by Georgia O'Keeffe, we saw artists looking to the city for inspiration, considering new technology and transportation, and painting those subjects using cubist visual language and abstracted forms. But there are also other trends. In the Midwest, a group of artists form regionalism, an, an ism that was a reaction to modern art and abstraction. These artists did not look to city life, but rather to life in the rural Midwest for their subject matter, and depicted what they saw not in accordance with modernism. Grant Wood was born on a farm in Iowa and trained as an artist in both the U.S. and Europe. He saw and absorbed lessons from Northern Renaissance painting during his travels. He painted his American Gothic in 1930 and showed this work at the Art Institute of Chicago, which helped him emerge on the national scene. In this close view of two figures, we see a father and his unmarried spinster daughter standing in front of their farmhouse. Multiple aspects of the picture reference the figure's piety, the Gothic style of their home with the pointed arch defining the shape of the window and the tracery, the cross forms in the facade of the home, and the steeple in the distance. Wood has had his dentist and his sister, who we see here, model for the two figures, though so they are used to play roles in this image. The painting resonates with specificity of depiction that we saw in the work of Jan van Eyck in showing such distinct and identifiable figures. Wood called them American Gothic people, and he says that he was trying to capture the feeling of folks from an album of old family photos. He paints the scene in a crisp, linear fashion like van Eyck. We can clearly see the intensity and focus with which they approach their important work as a farming family. These are hard-working Midwestern folks. The painting exudes a patriotic spirit as well, showing the world of the heartland, with figures filled with fortitude in a challenging time for the nation. The federal government started many programs to help people weather the economic and financial story of the 1930s, including trying to support artists. In 1935, the Works Progress Administration was founded, which provided financial support to builders, artists, and other arts professionals. This resulted in federal arts funding, and many of the artists who rise to prominence in later decades and who made contributions to the story of American art got their feet wet working on WPA projects. Jacob Lawrence was from Harlem in New York and grew up surrounded by the rich, creative atmosphere of the Harlem Renaissance. He also benefited from WPA funding, which supported the founding of the Harlem Community Art Center, with which he was associated, and he also worked on a WPA project. In 1940, he began working on his Migration series, composed of 60 panels that showed different episodes from the massive movement of African Americans from the rural South to the urban North in the years after World War I, but continuing into the 1960s. Black families moved for loads of reasons, including wanting to increase opportunity and access, as pervasive racism continued to limit education, employment, and the ability of African Americans in the South to accumulate wealth and own property. Lawrence's family migrated in the Great Migration from the South to New Jersey, where he was born, so this was a story and a context that was part of his family history. The first panel from the series shows the packed platform or station as African Americans pick their northern city and move forward, away from the South. Lawrence used flat shapes of color to create forms derived from cubist visual language and sharply slanted spaces or boxed-in settings and just a few colors throughout the series. These characteristics create patterning that also shows his conscious emulation of African art traditions. Other panels in the series reveal that discrimination and racism were different but still prevalent in the North, with scenes showing segregation and continued struggles. After serving in the Coast Guard during World War II, Lawrence became an art teacher and professor working at the University of Washington. His self-portrait from 1977 shows him in his studio with the tools of his trade, including depictions of some of his earlier works of art. He depicts himself using his distinctive style with flat areas of solid color, a synthesis of his approach to art making that shows what he called his dynamic cubism, enlivening his depiction of self with vibrant color and shapes. 
Another artist who benefited from government patronage is Dorothea Lang. She was a portrait photographer who shifted to taking photos of everyday people, eventually working for a government agency that helped struggling farming families during the Great Depression. Lang was hired to use her skills as a photographer to document how poor rural families were living at that time and how they were trying to survive such an awful situation. She photographed a group of migrant workers in California and took quite a few shots of this mother and children, creating an archetypal image of the Depression as a mother expresses the concern and stress of trying to care for and feed children with no means to do so. Lang was a recently divorced 40-year-old mother of two at the time she took the photo. The government agency that employed photographers like Lang distributed these images to the press, including this one. And in this case, that resulted in a national news story and the sending of aid to California and the opening of camps to help provide relief to starving workers. The presentness and clarity of Lang's image and her capturing of such a detailed, expressive scene from life added to the effectiveness of this photo in helping to alleviate suffering. Lang's photograph is part of another ism at this time, social realism, which was a pivot by artists to show everyday life and societal issues like poverty and racism in both urban and rural contexts. WPA and other government art patronage during the Great Depression period contributed and supported social realism. But there were other more modernist veins as well in the 1930s. An influx of artists immigrating to the U.S. from Europe sparked further interest in modernism and developments across the pond. American artist Alexander Calder came from an artistic family but started off training as an engineer. He spent time in Europe interacting with Dada and Surrealist artists, even visiting Mondrian. He began to think about creating works of art composed of floating, moving shapes of color. So he created mobiles, a term coined by Duchamp at that time to describe the moving works of art he produced merging Calder's engineering and artistic interests and training. This 1939 mobile was commissioned by the Museum of Modern Art in New York City to hang in a stairwell at a new museum building. He balanced the forms in his mobile so that they would hang evenly, but designed it to facilitate constant movement caused by air through ventilation systems, doors opening and closing, or objects moving around it. The forms could be understood as from nature, organic shapes like the title implies, lobster trap and fishtail, but could also be seen as geometric shapes, especially oval forms. The shadows of the work in the mobile itself and its nearly constant movement almost make it seem alive, dancing as it hangs from the ceiling. The randomness of the object's movements descends from the Dada interest in chance in the production of art and the amoeba-like forms relate to a branch of surrealism. We see new materials for art, aluminum and steel, similar to Oppenheim's object Duchamp's fountain and Picasso's still life with chair caning. Frida Kahlo was a self-taught Mexican artist who created works of art that many scholars have associated with surrealism, though she denied that label. Her work is intensely personal, drawing on her life experiences, including sickness and accidents. She painted while recovering in bed, and especially used images of herself in her work, talking about how she knew herself best. In this self-portrait, she shows her divided identity between her German ancestry through her father, as seen in the lace dress on the left, and her Mexican heritage through her mother, as seen in the local clothing on the right. Kahlo used blood in her, in her work to indicate connection, and the hearts of both figures are linked through the arteries she depicts. On the left, a medical tool clips off the artery, while on the right it ends with a portrait of her husband and fellow artist Diego Rivera when he was young. She shows a dream realm where objects and figures as depicted could not exist in the natural world, which is one of the characteristics of surrealism. As we've seen with other self-portraits, Kahlo uses the genre to pose questions about her identity as an artist and how she fits into her world and society. Increased tension and turmoil in Mexico left over from a revolution in the 19-teens pervaded the context in which she worked when her country, like her, was trying to determine what its identity was going to be and she brought her voice to bear on the formation of that identity through her political activity. During her life, she received international attention for her work and used her own image, her self-portrait, as she worked out her life in paint. The 1930s saw diverse production from the depictions of Midwestern life and documentary images of the Great Depression to renewed trends in modernism in the U.S. and Mexico.